what is up ds3 tv we are back for another video and i told you guys we were going to get to uh queen and zynga's uh part two um uh video on, on extra credits i said we we're going to get to that on sunday but that didn't happen so we're getting to it today so yeah um this is part two and um yeah let's get into it and this was recommended to me by a subscriber, so you can, you know, you can also recommend me videos down in the description. I mean, down in the comment section down below. And uh, subscribe to the channel. We'll get down subscribers by my uh, birthday, September 13th. And, yeah, let's get into it and play. Angola Hari is a man beset by terrible odds. On one side stands the people of his country, furious that he's allowed the Portuguese to make a mockery of their pride. On the other, the Portuguese themselves wait with their restrictions and rules, demanding that he enact their policies. A ruler in name, but in truth a servant of colonial powers, he knows that he is their pawn. But he'll also do everything they ask. He'll give up his wives, the traditions of his people, and accept baptism from Catholic priests, anything to ensure his safety. Because somewhere in the jungle, a wrathful queen waits to reclaim the throne that has been taken from her. The throne where Angola Hari now sits. And when she comes for what is owed, there'll be no place for him to hide. Very interesting start to this, uh, to, to this episode. Queen Nzinga had become the first West African ruler to truly challenge the Portuguese expansion. But her defiance was not without consequence. And Zynga's adversaries, infuriated by the fact she'd proven far less pliable than they'd hoped, ousted her and installed Angola Hari in her stead. But as far as Nzinga was concerned, that was only another problem to conquer. Because there were other European powers arriving in West Africa. Powers that were rivals to the Portuguese and could counterbalance their dominance, like the Dutch. In fact, the nearby Kingdom of Congo had already enlisted Dutch aid in fighting back. Nzinga quickly dispatched ambassadors to force a secret alliance with the Congo and their new Dutch allies. And emboldened by this partnership, she moved her base of operations to begin preparing an assault on her old enemies. But that relocation meant assuring that local lords acknowledged her rule, and those who did not, she burned to the ground. As whispers of her victory spread, Angola Hare's influence crumbled. Provincial leaders withdrew their support, pledging fealty to Nzinga. So furious were the ensuing conflicts between Nzinga's allies and the Portuguese, and so bloody the aftermath, that news of her successes reached the ears of Portugal's monarchy. This queen had become more than an annoyance. She was a genuine threat. So in 1645, the king of Portugal sent an official to Angola with orders to retake the nation. A small show of force to demonstrate the might of the Portuguese empire. But instead of news of victory, he received chilling dispatches. Nzinga devastated the Portuguese force, and what forces remained were pinned down, trembling in their fortifications. If the Portuguese wanted to maintain hold on West Africa, they would need to commit to a decisive move, and quickly. Nzinga's spies warned her of the oncoming fleet. An army of thousands was about to land on her doorstep, the largest enemy force she'd seen in her lifetime. And while her spy networks did learn of her enemy's plans, the oncoming battle was still too much to endure, and her attempted defiance fell to pieces. The Portuguese simply had too much firepower, too many soldiers. She couldn't fight a war of attrition against such odds. They seized her royal archive, exposing her spy network and revealing the alliance with Congo and the Dutch. And also, one of the captives they took was Nzinga's own sister. It was personal now. And as other rulers had already learned, you do not make things personal with Queen Nzinga. Retreating to safe ground, she revamped her strategy. Direct confrontation was ineffective. The enemy was just too strong. So she went back to what she knew, the roving, hit-and-run guerrilla tactics that had worked so well in winning her throne. Not to mention, she signed an open compact with the Dutch now, the secret being truly out. This, of course, meant war. The Dutch, Congo, and Nzinga against the Portuguese and their allies. And at first, Nzinga and her Dutch contingents routed the enemy, driving them back to their colonial capital and putting it under siege. But Portugal had an asset the Dutch did not, a transatlantic empire. In addition to forces in West Africa, their firmly held colony in Brazil proved a perfect staging ground for marshalling troops. 
They raised an army, crossed the Atlantic, and swept all before them. The Dutch capitulated, and Nzinga, bereft of her strongest ally, retreated yet again. But this retreat was not like her others, because the Dutch were gone, and her armies fractured. Not to mention, her sister remained in Portuguese captivity. Alone, surrounded by enemies, Nzinga needed a new plan. So unable to expel the Portuguese, she developed a strategy to suppress their expansion. The first tactic was political and economic. She maneuvered the remains of her forces between the Portuguese and the lands where they conducted slave raids. And second, she reached out to Catholic missionaries in Angola, claiming she wanted to replace local traditions with Catholic beliefs. Now, whether this newfound piety was sincere is hard to say. But if it was an act, it was a convincing one. Catholic missionaries became enthralled with Nzinga, some even volunteering to serve as her political intermediaries in Africa and Europe. Whether moved by Nzinga's embrace of their faith, or simply relieved to see their enemies so humbled, the Portuguese opened peace negotiations. In 1656, they freed her sister, and, after many long years, acknowledged Nzinga as the undisputed ruler of Matamba. Ah, so she did get her crown back, okay. And that is when Nzinga changed tactics yet again. Because now that she was at peace with Portugal, she could finally settle old scores. The Umbengala, the marauding warrior society that had sheltered her brother, were still operating. Nzinga had mixed opinions of them, sometimes even enlisting them as allies when they weren't fighting for the Portuguese. But it was time to end that dance. Despite being old enough to be a great grandmother to some of her soldiers, she personally led a campaign into their lands decapitated their leader, and brought his head to the Portuguese governor. But this last battlefield triumph, impressive as it was, was nothing compared to Nzinga's final act, because she was about to remake herself the consummate diplomat. In the dusk of Nzinga's life, she remade herself in the style of the Portuguese. Her wardrobe became more elaborate, mirroring European aristocracy. Silk drapes, velvets, brocades, scents, and perfumes all adorned her. And whenever she held audience, she did so with a crown on her head, her limbs heavy with jewelry, and her court opulent with similar ornamentation. If the Portuguese must absorb her into their ranks, she would stand as tall as any of the European queens. Talks of war became discussions on how to institutionalize Christianity within the country and abolish the Umbingala's war ideology, which stood in stark contrast to Portuguese sensibilities. She organized baptisms and built churches, and when Nzinga reunited with her recently released sister, she confessed to wanting to rule over a Christian community as a Christian queen, and in a Christian marriage. At 75, Nzinga came to a priest speaking of her regrets. She wanted a child. The priest was taken aback. Fumbling, he informed her that a miracle of that caliber would require her to give up her many lovers and concubines. Not to mention, there was no guarantee such an act of faith would be able to buy her the miracle she desired. But the priest also wanted to ensure Nzinga had no grounds to blame God. After all, she was still a convert, and he worried she might turn back to the old days. So, the church gave her the green light. Thusly empowered, Nzinga chose a youth from her court to marry. A graceful and robust boy, beautiful in features, and very, very, very much her junior. Then. On the day of her wedding, she baptized one of her own captains so her sister would also have a Christian man to marry. And she capped off the ceremony by urging the assembled guests to embrace Christian monogamy. Now, to this day, most historians don't really know what to make of this. Was this sudden talk of weddings and childbirth the whim of an eccentric powerful woman? Or was it an elaborate farce, constructed as a joke at the expense of the Portuguese and the church? Regardless. After the wedding, Nzinga went back to transforming Ndongo Matamba into the Christian empire she said she dreamed of, founding churches and reopening new channels of communications with Europe. Her cultural campaign, along with her record of military victories, had shielded her lands from foreign occupation. And even on her deathbed, she begged her counselors to continue her efforts, to ensure that the country became what she hoped it would be, and to allow a priest to bury her in the Christian manner. And so passed Queen Nzinga, a woman who, despite being one of the best documented rulers in early modern Africa, still presents a puzzle. Her record, from ambitious noble, to guerrilla fighter, to consummate diplomat, to religious reformer, is still haunted by myths conjured by her enemies, not to mention a few constructed by Nzinga herself. 
In Matamba, she had built a state on equal footing with the burgeoning Portuguese colony and in doing so, created a legacy of pride and self-rule that people still celebrate in modern Angola. They've printed coins in her image and made films of her exploits. Mm. And in the city of Luanda, where her opulent embassy met the Portuguese, stands a bronze statue of one of the first to fight for Angola's freedom, Queen Nzinga. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's actually a really cool thing. And I believe that's the end of the video. So yeah, uh, talk to you guys in the next. Um, video and yeah so this was a nice final video to and to talk about the rest of her life um yeah and also subscribe to the channel we'll get down subscribers by my birthday september 13th and also recommend me videos in the comment section down below so i have videos to uh to watch and react um for you guys and uh yeah talk to you guys in the next video and peace